بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. This is the last recording in the series, um, the middle path during differences or Islamic unity. In as soon as started recording, the rain uh, started, so I hope it doesn't interfere with the recording too much. This last section has a Sheikh Mawlana Zakaria rahmatullah in his book Al-Atidal, which I would recommend. Uh, all brothers, especially those involved in any sort of effort of deen, whether it be madrasa, whether it be a dawah effort, uh, whether it be a jamaat, an association. Um, because when we deal with people and we're in groups of people, um, politics, um, ikhtilaf, difference of opinion, um, rubbing each other up the wrong way, all of those things can occur. That's human nature. Uh, but because it's Muslims and it's Islam and it's Haq, then another a, a layer is uh, added to it which results in um, uh, like a deeny, it comes, it, it affects our deen actually and may affect our akhirah obviously because if it affects our deen then it affects our akhirah as well. Hazrat Shaykh Mullah Zakaria Rahmullah in the last statement that's given by the person who wrote the letter to him uh, says that um, that it seems that the difference among the ulama has caused a lot of grief. Uh, it seems that the by ulama di differing and disagreeing and so forth, this is a source of um, actually the uh, harm uh, to the Muslims. And he said, firstly, the difference among the ulama is a rahm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is a mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What the ummah agrees upon, has consensus upon, is very... A uh, few things in the sense that uh, it's many things, but it's in the overall scheme of things There's some absolutes with the whole ummah agrees upon There's quite a few disagreement and uh, that uh, Consensus on those things. I mean, it's quite a even though it might be um, Like for example, what decides what you're whether you're Muslim or not Those matters are very few about a hundred or so matters what actually, you know, there's other subsidiary issues and those are in comparison so many and there's so much difference of opinion but alhamdulillah it is a rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even those differences are also a rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Umar ibn Abdul Aziz rahmatullah the second Umar the Khalifa of Islam what he said was that if it wasn't for the difference we wouldn't have any concessions or any flexibility by having the differences and agreements whether between the four Imams or whether between the Sahaba Sahaba radiallahu differed on issues and they all learned their deen from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa so therefore, to say that differences is something that cannot exist or some people have an attitude that differences are wrong, you know, the core things we don't disagree on. Like for example, Fajr is two rakat, Luhur is four rakat, Fatiha is, should be read in every rakat. Now there's a difference about the Imam should just read or the followers should read as well or when the Imam reads loud, they should, but Fatiha is part of every rakat, uh, whether it's Imam or the group, uh, followers reading. There are things that we except Ramadan we have to fast in Hajj is obligatory once in a life right so there, there are core things that all Muslims agree on despite their madhab despite their fiqh school despite their um, the problem in when it comes to controversies and differences has a sheikh outlines in this last section and wrapping up the book there are some causes for it um, and I quote him, he says, Now I ask you to take careful note what I say. In my humble opinion, there are two causes for these ever increasing controversies of today. One pertains to the ulama and the other concerns the masses, the non-ulama, the public. The fault of the ulama is that they do not keep their difference in non-principal matters confined to the ulama. No, in fact, many of them go out of their way to solicit and canvass support of the masses and have them on their side in their battles. The problem is they take their differences in non-principle matters, non-core matters, which are not that important. Like they're not as important as usuli or core matters. They take these subsidiary issues and they argue it out in public and they try to get the masses and the public support. Uh, they, they thereby, with the help and support of the masses, endeavor to insult and degrade the ulama of truth. In truth, for them, the best line of action should be this. They should express their views and findings fearlessly and without fear announce that which they consider the truth. In that, they should also not be afraid of the blame thrown at them by critics and not take notice as to whether anyone acts according to these findings or not. It's not that important. 
that everybody follows you. If you're establishing the truth, it doesn't matter. It should not, firstly, they should not be fearful. Ulama should not be fearful. It's as simple as that. When it comes to the matters of haqq, this is what our deen teaches us. This is one of the jobs of the ulama, is not to be scared. Uh, when the masses, when association, groups, jamaat and so forth, when they become unhinged and they do mistakes, then it is the job of the ulama, especially the ulama in those organizations, in those jamaats, they have to speak up and uphold the sharia. Else they are to be blamed and they will be censured and Allah protect, punished on the day of judgment because of not speaking up when the haq was, for whatever reason, they kept quiet. And also not, uh, they're not to take notice whether anyone follows them or not. If they've done their research and they've checked what they're saying is correct, shara'an in sharia, um, and they've done their research and they felt or they know that something is wrong and they speak up. Whether people listen to them or not, there are anbiya will come and now people uh, decide whether something is true, if how many followers you have online or how many people support you or whether you're famous or not. This, this has no bearing on truth because there are kuffar who are much more famous than Muslim, but they're still kuffar. So the idea that we have to... Um, uh, followers, uh, there'll be anbiya coming with nobody behind them on the Day of Judgment. As a Sheikh gives this example in the in Mishkat al the the is it is anbiya with no, not a single follower. Now people are deciding that if so, how many people are with us, that doesn't decide. The truth is not based on how many supporters. The truth is decided on what the Quran and Sunnah say. That's how, that's the yardstick of measurement, not our feelings, not uh, if people upset us or people done something else that's got nothing to do with the actual issue. You know, like we bring in so many other factors which have no bearing on actual issue. Uh, the Sahabi Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, he was against, uh, the, he, he, he had the view that it's not permissible to accumulate wealth. And this went in contra, contra, like you can't actually own anything, you can't keep anything. And this went against the verdict of the majority of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu, who had a different view, but he did not stop him from speaking up, even though he disagreed with all the other Sahaba radiallahu anhu. Um, and Hazrat Sheikh gives many, many examples of um, differences between elders and, and so forth. So the, the, the reason for the controversy, the reason uh, the controversy is one reason is the ulama themselves fall in trap becoming like politicians where they're canvassing support trying to get this madras on their side this institution aside this board on their side and all they're doing and they're canvassing they're politicking they tr this type of attitude is what causes in ikhtilaf and differences causes controversy the second they're trying to win over uh, people the second controversy the reason why controversy uh, happens is uh, the continuation of these controversies closely connected with the reason discussed above but is a more severe cause of controversy it is that the masses among the muslims have made it the unnecessary habit of passing judgment on religious affairs they're talking whether somebody is a muslim or not they're talking somebody is astray or not they're not qualified to do that if they're not ulama they're not qualified to even make that comment whether a certain muslim is astray or a group is astray or not they are not because when they when the average person starts judgment on ulama and on other muslims this has happened in australia so many times muslims have called other muslim mushriks they've called them kafirs it is possible some sect can go off track and commit kufr like for example the ahmadiyya qadianis 100 percent they're kafir because they believe another man 100 years ago was a prophet they don't they claim there's another person who came as a prophet after Rasulullah, which automatically takes a person out of Islam. These type of um, uh, but what's happening is that non qualified people, unqualified people are passing judgment in Sharia matters, which are extremely sensitive, especially when it comes to Islam and Kufr, misguidance and misguidance and so forth. Therefore, as the Sheikh quotes, وَلَا تَنَازَعُوا فَتَفْشُلُوا وَتَذْهَبُ رِيحُكُمْ The ayat Quran, and dispute not with one another, lest you falter and your strength departs from you. Don't fall into these uh, um, disputes, and especially irrelevant disputes. And he keeps on, uh, as the Sheikh goes for very, and he gives some severe warnings as well. From this 
has been written above, you'll have to come to know that every form of difference of opinion is denounced. Uh, this is quoting the ayat of Quran. Abuse not those unto whom you they pray besides Allah, lest they wrongfully abuse Allah through ignorance. I mean, we have been forbidden from abusing the idols of the mushrikeen, the idol of the idol worshippers. They're false gods, the stones and wood that they worship. But he says, Hazrat Sheikh says, but when you look at the adherence of the Quran, we find that not one political function, gathering or procession, is free from the shouting of slogans against opponents and, sl uh, and slogans for the destruction and ruin of the elders and leaders of opposing parties. We find that instead of striving for the building of, up of itself and strengthening its forces and working out its schemes, every party tries to work for the downfall of others, to swear them into the earth and to uh, wish them dead. It is so funny that every part wish, party wished the other party dead and yet they cry and complain that the Muslims are heading for destruction. The, the Hazrat Sheikh's advice, this is why I'm saying Madrasa students in the beginning, Mufti Shabir, the uh, Shabir, I believe the principal of, um, uh, I think it's from Darum Zakaria, if I'm correct, uh, one of the ulama there, that he, uh, he made a note at the start that every student of, of Madrasa uh, the, Daru, yeah, the Prince of Darul Zakaria, uh, Sh uh, Shabir Ahmed Saluji says he translated this in, uh, or he put the forward to this in 1994. He said every student should read this um, and reread it, read it and reread it. Uh, every alim should read this book, Al Atidal, or Islamic Siyasat in Urdu, or Al Atidal, and it's called Al Atidal in English as well. Uh, the middle way, um, how sad it is that we don't see that we're shooting ourselves in the foot that when we attack other muslims um and we complain about our plight of the ummah and the and we are busy attacking and criticizing uh each other on very subsidiary issues you know we have much more bigger issues uh to be concerned with and we are uh being pet petty and uh unnecessarily Hazrat Sheikh Rahmullah gives many, many examples um, uh, from the hadith on how proofs are dealt with, and he brings some usuli principle, usulu fiqh principles to discuss how we remove the contradiction. If there's some hadith and there's difference of opinion, the meaning of the hadith even among the Imams, how it should be applied, how they remove, how they meaningfully uh, combine the meanings of the hadith. Um, and then at the end, he discusses something interesting is why is why differences in deen? People who are conversant with deen often have a problem which they find difficult to solve or answer. The problem is this in the physical sciences, natural science, and mathematics and arithmetic, you do not see any difference of opinion. But how is it that in religious sciences and theology, there always seems to be difference of opinion, different viewpoints, different theories and explanations? From time immemorial till today, there never has been an era where there are no differences in religion. The irreligious ones have taken this problem so seriously, the irreligious ones, the Bedin, the ones who don't have deen from among the Muslims, have taken this so uh, seriously that they reach a stage where they point blankly rejected religion itself as a reality, disbelieving in it completely. Others again have accepted religion itself, but denied theology, diniyat, and adherence to deen. These people should have known that accordance to their own admission, uh, there has always been dissent. This descent is a natural phenomena, which is in itself quite necessary. Otherwise, how would it have been possible for it to exist continually over a thousand of, thousands of years from era to era? We do not know how many sages and philosophers, men of ex exceptional wisdom, have passed through its ways. Now for the answer to this query. Actually, the subjection again, uh, uh, against deen results primarily from not being well conversant with deen. Basic, there are two causes of descent in deen. One pertains to differences in the basic fundamental, the usul, and the other concerns uh, difference in the lesser sub subdivisional or subsidiary matters of furu, of a non-principal uh, stature. When, differ, when religions differ in basic fundamental principle, 
it is because of a specific reason. Deen is the name given to that institution of acting upon the commands and instruction of the creator of the worlds. And for the Lord of the worlds, it is true that he should set forth such order and proclamation which are suitable and in the welfare of his creatures at any specific time. So basically quite a long explanation. In that what he's saying is that there's certain core things that are unshakable, like Tawheed, oneness of Allah, like the Prophet ﷺ being a prophet and the final messenger. There are certain things, five times Salah, there's certain core fundamental things, the pillars of Islam, core things is that we have to do, five times daily Salat on time. No one disagrees about these things. But the deen has flexibility built into it because of our circumstances. So when a different situation and era comes with different circumstances, like we live, there's so many things that we have to deal with today, which a hundred years ago, Muslims never had to deal, or even 30 years ago. What's the rules in social media? Is it backbiting when I message on WhatsApp or any of these uh, uh, online uh, mess messaging apps? Is that riba as an example? So there will be no fatwa for WhatsApp or for any messaging, messaging, uh, messaging service a hundred years ago because they didn't exist. You have letters and so forth and m m uh, notes may be written. You know, so what the fatwa of WhatsApp will not make sense to an alim a hundred years ago because it did, didn't exist. But the Sharia has given principles for the for deriving new rulings. So by not, uh, there are certain things that change the ahkam, the rulings change through time. There are certain things that you can't change. Uh, they will never change. And they, those are usuli matters, absolute, like Sahaba radiallahu anhu, their status, uh, the finality of the Prophet sallallahu uh, prophethood and messengership of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he gives many, many examples where difference occur uh, in the Sahaba because there are things that happen in life which doesn't have an explicit ruling directly to that specific situation. So in trying to understand and get to the truth, ulama would differ. You know, they will try to use sound principles, but it's possible they come to maybe. And that goes right back to Sahaba radiallahu It's not something, uh, uh, something new. Um, in the last, uh, he wraps up in terms of dealing with the time, especially the time that we live in. It's a very interesting issue that uh, Mullah Zakaria Rahmullah brings up actually. He talks about um, excluding yourself from society. Now, if it is, he's saying that the mischief has increased, the fitna has increased. Um, maybe it's better to stay away from people. And Imams have differed on this. But he quotes Imam al nawawi rahmullah, the great Shafi'i Imam, that uh, according to Imam Shafi'i rahmullah, it's better to mix with the people, society. Because when you have ikhtilaf and differences, you have two options. Either continue staying and tolerating whatever ikhtilaf or differences that are there, or withdraw from society. Imam Nawi rahmullah had the view, and he quotes Imam Shafi'i rahmullah, the Imam of his school, that by not mixing with the people, Oh, sorry, by uh, mixing with the people is the better of the two. Because by associating with men, many religious benefits are derived and one has the opportunity to participate in numerous Islamic practices. By living collectively in congregation, the great number of the Muslim multitude of people is illustrated. Similarly, the person with free association with the crowds is able to do much good and prohibit the bad. Helping others in the spread of deeds and piety and righteousness. Helping the needy attending the congregation of the Muslims and so many other deeds. As for that person who is an alim or a pious, righteous man, on him it is even more strongly recommended that he should freely associate with people. However, there is another party among the learned who believe that in spite of all the above benefits and advantages, seclusion and staying aloof from the people is better. They say that in, 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 this is a person, this person is sure to be safe from evil. But there is one condition attached to this, and that is that this person applies himself diligently in the, uh, to the ibadah compulsory upon him. And on the occasion that he be acquainted with those things which are incumbent upon him. So, because knowledge is learned by, from other people, and you mix and stay with people, and you learn ilm from them. Ibadah, five times salat, because adhan is there, you're in jamaat and so forth. So you get to jamaat salat on time. This person just has to make sure two things. He knows what is... Uh, uh, what his obligations are, he has the knowledge of his, especially if he's not a alim, he knows what the fodder things, what things has to do, so he doesn't miss out on the obligations. And also, he does, he's diligent about his ibadah, especially his compulsory ibadah. The most preferable view is that 
Only when a person has strong presumption that he should not be involved in a sin, it is better to mix and associate with people. Allama Kirmani says in our times it is preferable to seclude yourself and to remain in solitude because nowadays it is very seldom that any gathering is devoid of sinful acts. Allama Aini Rahmah says, I am also in agreement with Kirmani because in these times nothing is derived from gathering except sin. Imam Nawawi passed away in the year 676. Allama Kirmani passed away in 786. In a period of merely 100 years, time has changed so much that Imam Nawawi prefers mixing with people to be better and Allama Kirmani 100 years later says that seclusion and solitude is better. Allama Aini died 755 Hijri and he concurs wholeheartedly with Kirmani while explaining the upsurge in evil all around. Do 700 years ago, imagine if they saw our time. Now Hazrat Sheikh brings it to our time or the recent era. We are now in the, mind you, he's writing this pre-social media, pre-internet, pre-many of the vices that we have uh, that are uh, prevalent now. We are now in the second half of the 14th century and one can only imagine how many more evils have risen around us. Rasulullah said, every era that, draw, that dawns will exceed the era before it in evil. He's also reported to have said, you shall continue to enjoin the doing of good and continue to prohibit the doing of evil. However, when you see stinginess being obeyed and carnal desires being followed and the world becoming preferred over deed and every man uh, becomes infatuated with his own opinion and he sees such a state of affairs that there is no other way except silence then guide yourself to avoid being involved in trouble and cut off intercourse to the people, meaning mixing with the people. Soon as time will come when to uphold onto your religion will like a hole onto burning coal. How do you know when you reach that time? These are the things that because we're starting, we're getting, we're in there or we to hold on to deen is very hard. That on one side, your, our deen is, there's a huge social or collective community deen, masjid, jama'ah, janazas, so forth. But the other side, the shudder of people is so much that people are more infatuated with their own opinion than establishing the haq, than speaking the haq. Um, it's, it's, it's driven by uh, ex uh, external factors other than the deen itself. Um, social pressures. I mean, ulama are giving fatwas sometimes. Some ulama are giving fatwas based on social pressures, not on seeing the merit of the argument and trying to establish what is the right thing or wrong thing in deen based on that. Um, so Allahu Alam, but uh, in this time, this is something that has to be, each person has to decide himself because you do have to make sabr. Even if you go to a masjid, local masjid, there are issues in masjid with people. If you can tolerate the sabr, make sabr, ignore the one easy way to do this, maybe Allahu Alam, it's not to, uh, if usually the people have their own issues and they project it into Islamic organizations, into masjid, in jamaat. They're upset about something else or about their own life. They live a, maybe, uh, maybe have a personal miserable existence or that they have their own issues. And instead of, uh, so what they do is they take it out on people. So what happened when you come, people have their own frustrations. And I'm talking because in this time, if we cut ourselves off from the community and from the masjid, most of us are very weak in our ibadah. And if you cut ourselves from community and the masjid and salat, then we might lose out more than we gain. If we come to a masjid, there is one or two people always in every masjid uh, who have, they need an attitude adjustment. But if we make sabr with them, tolerate them, and we get rewarded for the sabr, the harms of the people we get rewarded for, for our own sake of our own deen. And also we are not become the source of resentment and stress for other people. Because people, if people are doing tough and they're coming, for example, the masjid, especially in a country like Australia, where we find peace and solace. And if we come into the masjid and we, we become the source of grief for other people. May Allah save us from that. So masjid is, is a place of sajda. It comes from the word sajda. It's a house of worship. It's a house of Allah. It should be free from disturbances. It should be free from uh, abusive language. It should be free from raised voices. It should be free from controversy. It should be free from ikhtilafat. Right? Because it's the house of Allah. It's not our house. The topic, I remember my father, Rahmullah Sheikh, the late Sheikh Sayyid, Rahmullah, uh, he used to, uh, in my Juma speech, I used to quote a lot of Imam's names. And he found that objectionable. He said to me, the member 
and the Jummah is for the dhikr of Allah. You shouldn't praise people too much in Jummah. Because uh, Allah says in the Quran, فَسْعَوْ إِلَىٰ ذِكْرِ لَكَ Hasten towards the, the remembrance of Allah, referring to Jummah. He had the view that um, I should not be, uh, you know, he was I was doing khutbah in front of him in that for many, many, almost a decade. So I had a, at least humble somebody there to watch over me, which is something I miss now. And he, um, you know, had 50 years of experience of khidmat of deen. Uh, he studied madras in the 50s and early 60s, rahmallah. So he used to, um, he, he, he said that the, like you talk too much about the creation or you quote too many pious people and imams and mashayikh and so forth in your Jummah. Because Jummah is for the, for the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not for praising other people. The point being, uh, it, it, the masjid has a specific sanctity and a code of behavior and uh, a topic topics to be discussed in the masjid and definitely it should not be a place of stress and fine like for example i have the view to follow the hilal side in our masjid the masjid doesn't follow it follows the board of imams and the calculation that they do in advance but for me to go in the masjid start fighting over this i mentioned my view that this is my view this is what i follow many brothers in the masjid follow this the committee has decided otherwise but we don't make it a conflict alhamdulillah the maturity is there and allah protected in the masjid despite on this issue we have a difference of what to do but there's a tolerance alhamdulillah and i hope allah keeps that is that we learn how to uh despite our differences we don't cross the moral lines we don't cross the sharia lines the knowledge lines and we don't destroy each other in the process, shoot ourselves in the foot. Because when you attack another Muslim, or the reputation of another Muslim, or the ilm of another Muslim, or his practice of another Muslim, based on politics or some other reason, which is not based on ilm and deen, uh, then you are um, you're shooting yourselves and you're attacking your deen. It's not just about that person. It's not if a person is, na'uzubillah, is doing stealing in the mosque or he's hurting another person in the mosque or in the community. Yeah, you should speak up because it's 100% haram to, to hurt somebody. But uh, on petty issues, very small issues, minor issues, people have called in our community, other Muslims, mushrik, and use very harsh words. I heard it in my own ears. And these are, uh, these, uh, this is unfortunately our uh, failure. And we have to learn to, over people argue about the Hilal issue as an example. I'm giving this example because we, uh, one day away from Ramadan people are argue about this um, as though we don't have enough problems in the Ummah to solve and as though we don't have anything like why is it that we get so frustrated because we uh, be, uh, do we really care about the teaching of Rasulullah or not is that why we're doing it or is it because of the social part of it that might be disturbed because we're having Eid on two separate days do we care about the deen and akhira or is it really i'm talking about i'm not saying this side or that side but do we really care about the deen or is it more about the social aspect of it do we really care about our accountability to rasulullah all have good intentions i my assumption is everyone has good intentions so we have to learn despite our differences despite this is the summary of the book despite our differences we can have differences and still be united we got to get over this thing of where, where we have to do exactly everything the same. It's not possible. We have to learn, like Sahaba radiallahu despite their disagreements on issues, they were still united, their hearts were united still. And the, as a sheikh in the end gave the example of the Battle of the Camel, where Sahaba came against each other in two different battles because of the issue that happened in the killing of Osman radiallahu anhu. And they faced off, and the, the Ali radiallahu the son in law of Rasulullah, cousin of Rasulullah on one side, Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu but, but when she fell from the camel, Ali radiallahu himself went to check how the mother of the believers is, even though she was on the opposing side and that's such a severe disagreement on the killing of Osman radiallahu how it should be dealt, dealt with. So you see, people can have much, very extreme differences, but their personal moral code, akhlaq, they don't cross the moral lines in Sharia. They don't cross those. That's the example they've been set for us. That we don't cross, we don't get into petty politicking and character assassinations and um, lying and at all costs, the ends justify the means. The ends don't justify the means. The ends you'll have to give hisab to. If you, in any difference, if you use adopt any means 
in a disagreement, in an ikhtilaf that is against Islam, you are liable for punishment before Allah. That you cannot say, Ya Allah, I did haram and I did this because of this thing of deen. No, the ways of deen are also to save deen, to safeguard deen, to protect the certain interest of a Muslim has to be in accordance to deen as well. It cannot be outside of Sharia. It not only will be not accepted by Allah because it's outside of Sharia deen, it will be punished, it's liable for punishment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us understanding. I recommend again strongly to the brothers and sisters to read this book Al Itidal. I've given the link in the description. Read it from cover to cover to understand how to deal with it. And if there's any questions, by all means ask uh, in the, question, in the uh, comments below. Put, a, put the questions there. We can discuss it to understand how to better practice our deen, especially in differences, and help this knowledge spread. Because we need to remove in many ikhtilafat that are unnecessary and uh, diffuse ikhtilafat as opposed to uh, magnifying them and creating more bitterness uh, in the ummah. We have to get away from that because Allah's help is not coming to us. We are beaten left and right all over the world. Uh, and Allah's help is not with us. One of the reasons, as I read the ayat, that Allah's help is lifted because of our internal disagreement and fights. You can't win if you're fighting and arguing with yourselves. Allah's nusra is lifted from us. It's already lifted from us. Uh, people think that someone gives you uh, some food and uh, feeds your group or gives you a free meal. Uh, that's like the help of Allah's arrived. No, look at the Ummah situation, where it is and where. We're going backwards in our deen in so many countries. So, and Muslims are suffering, whether it be in China, whether it be in Burma, whether it be in Palestine, whether it be, the list is very long. You know, and we, are, we got our head in the sand. Part of our problem is that we actually don't appreciate the different works of deen, the different Muslims, the people who do da'wah works, there's many works of deen and there's many works of da'wah. It's not one work of da'wah. It's not one work of deen. There's not one work. The Mona Zakaria mentions it. The rahmat of Allah is vast. Don't limit it. Who are you to limit it? Allah is giving his rahmah and sends his rahmah in so many different ways. Some people are teaching deen. Some people are doing da'wah to Christians. Some people are da'wah to atheists. Some people are doing da'wah online. Some people are doing uh, effort. Some people in tasawwuf, tazkiyah efforts, according to the Sharia, obviously. Some people are uh, involved in jihad. We don't attack each other. It's crazy. It's madness. If we attack the work somebody's doing, another work of Rasulullah some people are doing social welfare work. It's madness if we attack the thing everyone is doing to lift the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes one work dominates our minds so much and affects us so much and we love it so much that we might say statements of criti cr criticizing and putting down. We're only putting ourselves down. We don't need to. That person is doing that work. Dua